So we're going to be talking about cooking for the holidays. And as I mentioned, um, we really need to keep track of our food consumption during Thanksgiving. For us following the diet, portion control is going to be more important than ever. But of course, having the right recipes is going to make it easier because not only can we make our entire Thanksgiving meal low FODMAP, but it's going to be so delicious and tasty that we're going to be more it's going to be easier for us to to keep things in check so we're going to talk about turkey we're going to talk about stuffing we're going to talk about side dishes cranberry sauce mashed potatoes get their own get their own topic list uh, coming up um, we're going to address appetizers and dessert so if you have questions uh, for any of those topics maybe you can save them until we get to that particular part of the uh, discussion. But what I wanted to start with was I wanted to start with showing you a graphic of foods that have no detectable FODMAPs. And we're actually also going to discuss what that means. And the reason I'm starting there is because Monash University has lab tested these foods and they have told us that in the appropriate serving sizes that no FODMAPs have been detected in these foods. Now, Robin, can we get that up and let me know when that's up? Okay, Robin's going to um, work on getting a graphic up. So I will just read to you some of the items here because this is important. So red bell peppers, carrots, cucumbers, Endive, kabocha squash, which is called Jap pumpkin in some parts of the world, red leaf lettuce, parsnips, potatoes, and that includes starchy russets, Yukon gold type potatoes, and thin skinned red and white potatoes, radishes, and uh, common beefsteak tomatoes. All of these foods in the right portions have no detectable FODMAPs. That's so important. Think about that. Potatoes. I'm going to show you how you can make a variety of mashed potatoes or potato side dishes that you will be able to eat a really nice portion of without putting your FODMAP levels over the top. So it always really pays to study the app. We talk about the Monash University app endlessly. It's because it is our touchstone. We use the science to develop our recipes at FODMAP every day. And the more you use it, the information starts just getting absorbed in your head and you will start learning these things by heart. And then whether you're thinking about menu um, development, you know, what you want to make for your party or whether you're out at a restaurant, it'll come to you, ah, potatoes, no detectable FODMAPs. And you'll know that that's a safe item to look at. Then there's also a, um, a grouping that Monash says only has trace FODMAPs. And this includes foods like clementines and mandarin oranges. There's a lot of citrus coming up this time of year. So, oh, excuse me, that's no FODMAPs. The trace amounts, we've got arugula, we've got also known as rocket, we've got collard greens, kale, these are all trace amounts, iceberg lettuce, Swiss chard. So all of these vegetables can also are great choices to integrate into your holiday recipe uh, planning because they have so few FODMAPs. FODMAP stacking is a term that you've probably heard. And if there's one day a year that we need to pay attention to it, it is on Thanksgiving. And that is when you have a food. Let's say you know that a particular food is allowed in a two ounce portion or a quarter cup portion. Uh, but the FODMAP in that food happens to be fructans, which you would know from your app. And then let's say you take another food and that allowable portion is a half a cup or four ounces. Uh, and its FODMAP also is fructans. If you eat those portions at the same time, at the same meal, or in the same dish, that is stacking FODMAPs. And that's going to push your, in this instance, fructan level over the top. You might end up not feeling so well. So we want to be aware of these um, concepts for sure. So I didn't even get to the fruits. Let's go back to no FODMAPs clementines, mandarin oranges, navel oranges, 
uh, star fruit, also known as carambola. Grapes, did you know that green, red, and black grapes all have no detectable FODMAPs in very generous portions of about one cup? We just posted a recipe on the site um, uh, this week for a grape and apple crisp. And the reason I did that was because it took advantage of the fact that the grapes have no detectable FODMAPs and then the apples, which are allowable but in very small portions, are in the recipe in the right proportions for you to enjoy. Uh, papaya, no detectable FODMAPs. Prickly pear, rhubarb, uh, and strawberries. Maybe not the most seasonal um, uh, fruits and vegetables for those here in the US, but good to know nonetheless. So that's just something that I wanted to start with because I want to give you hope. I want you to feel positive about the fact that you're going to be able to be eating food on Thanksgiving. So let's go into um, my topics here. I wanted to talk about turkey first because for so many people that is going to be the centerpiece of your meal. And so I thought we'd first talk about uh, buying your turkey. So there are many different types of turkeys on the market, everything from frozen to fresh, from kosher to heritage, you know, and you have to read labels. So one thing you might wanna look for, if you're not buying a fresh killed bird from a butcher, if you are buying a frozen bird or you're buying a uh, bird that's been treated, you gotta read the label. There might be some natural flavors in there that you might need to check with the manufacturer about. This is one good reason why when choosing your turkey, I would recommend being able to go to a butcher and buying a uh, fresh turkey if possible. We like, uh, organic birds partly because of the way that they are fed they taste better they don't tend to be prepackaged they're not waterlogged they're not injected with saline solutions or any kind of natural flavors and the other reason I would recommend fresh is because even though frozen turkeys can be less expensive you need four to five you need 24 hours in the refrigerator to defrost every four to five pounds of that turkey. So if you have a 20 pound turkey or a 15 pound turkey, you're talking about a lot of time in the refrigerator. A lot of us don't have the space in the refrigerator. And with poultry, you wanna be very careful with how you defrost it. You're not gonna to wanna to defrost it at room temperature. So that's another reason to buy fresh. Uh, Robin put up our link for Turkey 101. We've got all this information uh, uh, on turkeys about the various kinds uh, and defrosting and all of that information in that link. And I should also mention that I would say 75% easily, 75% of what I'm talking to you about today is at FODMAP every day. So if you spend some time on our site, you will be able to read all of this information. Um, the remaining 25% is gonna be a mixture of things that you can find on the Monash University smartphone app, and then just what's coming out of my head. So that's why it's good to be here live. So you can quiz me, because you know what comes out now may never come out again. So turkey, that's about buying turkey. Now let's talk about uh, preparing turkey. At its most simple, salt and pepper, maybe some herbs like thyme and or sage and or rosemary, and maybe butter and or oil, some sort of fat to keep the breast nice and moist. You don't need more than that. I mean, of course, we have recipes on the site uh, that get a little fancier, but the point is that all of those ingredients are low FODMAP. You don't have to go outside of that. You don't have to worry about it. So um, really, it, it can be that simple. Oh, one more thing about buying turkeys. A long time ago, I switched from doing one big bird to two smaller birds for a couple of reasons. If you have the oven space, I highly recommend that. And this, of course, is if you have to feed a crowd because they uh, cook quicker and they cook more evenly. So if you've had a problem in the past with dry turkey, uh, one way to combat that is to do a smaller bird. You can just keep 
track of it better in the oven, and I highly recommend that. And then also instant read thermometers. Those little plastic pop-up timers that come embedded in so many turkeys, don't trust those. So get yourself a good instant read thermometer, and you're gonna wanna bring the middle of the breast up to 150 degrees. Now that may sound low, but that's because you're going to pull the turkey out at that temperature, 150 degrees Fahrenheit, and you're going to lightly tent it with aluminum foil, and you're gonna let it sit for at least 20 minutes, at least. And the temperature is going to rise, and uh, your meat will not be overcooked, it'll be moist and delicious, and during that time, you can make your gravy. Um, so maybe this is a good time, let's go right into gravy. Gravy. Now, this is sort of interesting. There's a couple things about gravy that I want to point out. Um, traditionally, um, gravy is often thickened with wheat flour, uh, sometimes with cornstarch. Now, if you have a recipe that you love that's tried and true that uses cornstarch, then you're good to go. Uh, you can also use a flour blend, uh, any kind of flour blend that you have in the pantry that maybe you bake with for your low FODMAP baking, you could use that instead of wheat flour. And while xanthan gum and guar gum are not FODMAPs, and I do actually like uh, baking blends with xanthan gum for my baking, uh, for something like this where you're thickening a gravy, uh, you don't need the gums. So if you have a blend without gum, uh, that will work. If you have a blend with gum, that will work too. You just don't need it. And the thing about gravy is that we have a make ahead gravy on the site. And I added a photo, um, which I would love you to check out uh, soon because this recipe was up last season, uh, a year ago, and it's a make ahead gravy. And so to make it ahead, I have you melt butter and add lots of uh, scallion greens, the green part only, and that's sauteed around, and then the flour, the gluten-free, low FODMAP flour is added and cooked, and a roux is created, and then chicken stock or turkey stock is added. And as you can imagine, that ends up being a very light-colored gravy. Now there's nothing wrong with a light colored gravy, but I added a photo uh, just a few weeks ago to the recipe because I have, now you can see what it looks like if it's made just as I described it. But then you can also now see what it looks like when you add the pan drippings from that turkey. So while the turkey is resting, you can move the turkey to a cutting board, and then you have all those juices in the bottom of the pan. And what you're gonna do is you're going to pour them into a measuring cup and just let it sit. And the fat's gonna rise to the top and you're gonna skim or pour that away. And what you're left with is this rich, dark, really delicious pan drippings. And you can whisk that into your gravy and you'll see in the photo that that gravy is rich and brown and it just even looks like it tastes uh, you know, more complex. And it is. Uh, so I highly recommend that. Uh, the other thing is Helle and I were chatting in one of the groups last week about umami. And she read our article on umami, which she enjoyed and said she finally understood what this is. And uh, you'll understand in a moment while I'm bringing it up now. So umami is literally the fifth taste. And maybe you haven't heard of it, but we have sweet, salty, bitter, and sour, which are four taste sensations. Literally, these are basic tastes that everybody tastes. Uh, but umami is a taste sensation as well. And it was identified in Japan uh, many, many, many years ago, but um, it, it took a long time for people in uh, our part of the world to recognize it. And it's defined as savoriness or deliciousness. And what happened was this Japanese man um, isolated what was in, um, 
dashi, which is Japanese broth. Uh, and what he wanted to know what made it so rich and so complex. I mean, here's this like watery looking thing. Um, and what he isolated with the bonito flakes, which are fish flakes, and the seaweed, which are the only two things that go into making dashi, is he isolated that it was glutamic acid. And glutamic acid is actually a naturally occurring amino acid. This is something that's natural. Now, maybe that sounds familiar. MSG is glutamate. It is the same thing. Um, MSG is not actually a bad thing. I'm not going to go into that in depth now. You can read more about it in the article. But the point is that there are certain foods that are umami rich, that give food a boost. And so many of us are saying, we hear people say all the time, my low FODMAP food doesn't taste flavorful. So things like soy sauce, miso, mushrooms, and we can have oyster mushrooms to a, a certain degree. So all of these things in gravy, for instance, so if you end up with a gravy that you feel doesn't have enough oomph, you could just add a little bit of soy sauce, which is low FODMAP, and people aren't going to register it as soy. You don't want to add that much, but it's going to add this umami. It's going to add this savoriness, this deliciousness, and that gravy with your turkey and with your mashed potatoes, nobody is going to be missing anything, I promise you. So check out that article on umami and check out the picture of the gravy with the pan drippings. I think it'll inspire you to take that extra step. So let's talk about mashed potatoes because isn't that the natural thing to talk about <laughs> after we've talked about gravy. So I already mentioned to you that um, Potatoes, so whether we're talking starchy potatoes like russets or Yukon gold potatoes, which are rich yellow in color and a little uh, waxier, or a really waxy potato like a red potato or a white potato, all of these potatoes have no detectable FODMAPs. This means you can pretty much make mashed potatoes the way you always have with very slight changes. So you can take your potatoes of choice, you can peel them or not peel them. You can boil them in uh, salted water. And then one of my favorite tricks, and this, is, this isn't a FODMAP thing, this is a cooking thing, is that after you drain the potatoes in the colander, put them back in the pot and just stir them around over low heat. You want to dry them out a little bit. This is going to make them super fluffy. And then you can add butter butter like you always have butter is low FODMAP and then if you used to use milk uh, and you still eat dairy which you can on the low FODMAP diet just switch to lactose free whole milk uh, cream you can have a little bit of cream so if you would like to use cream check your amounts on your Monash app potatoes are my favorite food group I'm with you Helly oh my gosh when I found out that I could still eat potatoes, that was one of my most exciting uh, beginning moments when I started this diet. Um, half and half, uh, you can find lactose free half and half pretty easily in the US markets. I know we don't have heavy whipping cream that's lactose free, but people do in other parts of the world. Uh, and then do not underestimate the amount of salt and pepper. Uh, you don't really need anything else, but you do need salt and pepper and you want it to be good salt and freshly ground pepper. And there you have traditional mashed potatoes that are low FODMAP. Now, for a lot of people with IBS, high fatty foods can be a trigger as well. And, you know, there's no thing around the fact that mashed potatoes can be very, very rich. So watch your portions. Robin uh, did, however, just put up a link for our vegan mashed potatoes, which take advantage of the starchy cooking water and also use olive oil. And those are not only vegan, but they are just a lighter mashed potato. So with all of the rich dishes that you're gonna be serving this holiday season, whether you're a vegan or not, that is a great recipe to check out and to consider adding uh, into, your, into the scheme of things. Um, I also want to mention sweet potatoes. So sweet potatoes are low FODMAP in pretty small portions. We have um, half a cup 
of um, chunked up raw sweet potato, 75 grams is what is low FODMAP. So I came up with a recipe for mashed sweet potatoes. And when you see the picture, I think you'll get pretty excited because it looks like this beautiful big casserole of mashed sweet potatoes happens to have some candied pecans on top, which are optional. But what's exciting about it is that it looks like uh, mashed sweet potatoes. It tastes like mashed sweet potatoes. But I used a lot of white potatoes and then added enough sweet potatoes to give you that mashed sweet potato um, experience. Julia is saying that sounds amazing. It is amazing. Uh, Kitty says she's getting hungry. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I tend to make people hungry. It's just one of the things that I do. <laughs> But if you like sweet potatoes and you've been mi missing mashed sweet potatoes, this is a great recipe because it takes advantage of the no FODMAP content of white potatoes to bulk up um, mashed sweet potatoes. So definitely check that one out. We also have, let's see, we have, so we have the vegan mashed potatoes. We have one of our most popular recipes, which is uh, do ahead mashed potatoes for a crowd. And I show you how to make low FODMAP uh, mashed potatoes that you can keep warm in a slow cooker. Really great for more casual uh, parties, larger parties, so you can check that out. And then I also, uh, a new recipe to us this year is I took advantage of carrots, parsnips, and potatoes, all uh, vegetables that happen to be no detectable FODMAP vegetables and created a mash with all three of them. And I did that one as kind of a rough mash. So it's like a little textured and you get to see the different colors and sort of the integrity of the vegetables is, is preserved somewhat. Um, so that's a great uh, recipe to check out too. So let's talk about stuffing. Um, I love stuffing. Um, I don't know about you, but I have to have stuffing on the table with my turkey. And we have several recipes on the site, everything from cornbread stuffing to uh, gluten-free uh, stuffings based on gluten-free bread. And we also have stuffings based on sourdough. Because um, hopefully by now you know that a traditionally risen sourdough is considered low FODMAP. And that's because during the fermentation process, the fructans in the wheat are consumed and we end up, it ends up being a mixture that is low enough in FODMAPs to be considered uh, elimination phase safe. So it's, and, it, and it's easier than ever here, especially in the US to find um, really good artisan bread, really good sourdough bread, check local bakeries if you can. Uh, we have articles on the site about fermentation and sourdough, so you'll understand what to look for. And we have a simple sourdough stuffing. We also have a new one this year that combines sausage and puts a little bit of apple in there, the low FODMAP amount of apple, um, which is really lovely. And in case you're wondering, technically, um, stuffing is stuffing when it's stuffed inside the bird. If it's in a casserole next to the bird, technically it should be referred to as a dressing. But I guess that's one of the one places. I tend to be a stickler for this kind of thing, but I just think of it all as stuffing. So um, if you put stuffing into our, um, our search bar and go to our recipe filter and look for stuffing, you'll find plenty. Uh, we also have one with, uh, we have a couple of cornbread ones. One of them has uh, bacon and pomegranate seeds. It's, it's really lovely. And then we have another one that has wild rice. And I was talking to somebody about this today in one of the Facebook groups, and I made a point of telling her, you know, read the whole recipe because you need to be aware that uh, wild rice has not been tested for FODMAPs yet. And we cannot extrapolate because it is not similar to other rices 
wild rice is actually a grass. So botanically, it's a very different thing. Uh, the reason why I included it was because not only do I give a full description of what you need to be aware of, but also just anecdotally, uh, myself and other FODMAPers that I know have tolerated it quite well in moderate proportions, of course. And so if it's something that you want to try, uh, we have it for you. So that's it for stuffings. Let's talk about do ahead for stuffings for a moment. So if you're making stuffings and uh, we have the do ahead gravy I mentioned, we have the do ahead uh, mashed potatoes that I mentioned, and now uh, stuffing. Most stuffing can be made ahead, put into a casserole dish, covered with plastic wrap and put in the fridge overnight. You just want to make sure you bring it back to room temperature before you put it in the oven and you cannot stuff your turkey ahead. Don't do that. That um, provides a bacterial breeding ground. It's like, it's okay, I'm going to make a bad joke here. It's like we would be giving the turkey um, SIBO or something. So don't do that. So that's uh, stuffing some do ahead tips for you. Um, let's talk about like vegetable side dishes for a moment. So green beans, you know, a lot of people um, want green beans on their uh, their holiday table. And green beans are one of those vegetables that you can eat, but there are definitely strict amounts. Um, whether you're looking at the FODMAP Friendly app or whether you're looking at the Monash app, they both peg it at 75 grams, uh, which is the, the uh, allowable amount, which is about 15 beans. But when you think about it, that's not such a small serving, um, especially if it's going to be on your plate with stuffing and potatoes and a whole bunch of other things. You might end up just taking, you know, four or five or six beans. So since we know that green beans are okay, um, how can we prepare them? Well, we can prepare them as simply as steaming them, which I actually like to have some really simple green vegetables in and amongst all the rich food. So that's something to certainly consider. And then Robin teased me because I developed a recipe this year called triple onion green beans and she said you're really tempting fate aren't you you're just waiting for all those people on social media to be going what but um basically it takes advantage of onion infused oil and it takes advantage of uh sauteed leeks and scallions one two three onions uh so if you've missed uh your your green bean casserole with its onion topping then that's the green bean recipe for you and then we also have a pan roasted green bean recipe uh with with almonds so let's talk about that for a second um pan roasted so that happens on top of the stove what i want to point out here is um you know, I maintain a test kitchen, which I have for years. I have uh, a lot of, I got a, I got a lot of everything. I got a lot of pots and pans. I got a lot of burners, but you know, not everyone does. And so when you are devising your menu, you're not only going to be thinking about, you know, flavor. I mean, what is it that you want to eat? Uh, but you have to be thinking about FODMAP levels and you should be thinking about logistics. So for instance, if you have a four burner stove, you don't want to pick six recipes that need a burner. Or likewise, if you just have a standard oven and you only have one oven and you know the turkey is going to be in there, you don't want to pick recipes that require a lot of time uh, and space in the oven. So you you know looking through the recipes and you see things like this and you see that the the make ahead mashed potatoes can be done in a slow cooker over on the counter and that these pan roasted green beans can be done on a burner and that the stuffing can be heated in the oven alongside the turkey and then the gravy is you know reheated in the microwave or reheated on a burner and you're still good to go so you want to think about things like that so that you're not caught at the last minute with either not enough pots and pans or not enough burners or oven space. So that's green beans. Let's just also um, reflect back on a couple of the, the no FODMAP vegetables. So we have kabocha squash, 
which is a rich winter squash. That's a wonderful uh, side dish for the holidays. We've got uh, kale and um, collard greens and Swiss chard, all of which have trace amounts. A simple saute of greens would be lovely. Carrots, as I mentioned before, no detectable FODMAPs. Uh, you could do a saute of carrots. You could do steamed carrots. You could do carrots uh, with a little bit of maple syrup and butter and salt and pepper. Uh, so definitely pay attention to the no FODMAP or trace FODMAP vegetables uh, to round out your meal. Then cranberry sauce. Mm, I love cranberry sauce. You will notice on the site that I am a little cranberry sauce crazy. Um, we have several. We have everything from a fairly traditional um, cinnamon uh, spiced um, cranberry sauce to a savory one with horseradish to a super simple one that has um, cranberries, water, uh, and orange marmalade, which was a revelation. That's a new recipe for us. And you literally dump and mix and stir and cook and you're done in 10 minutes. And the orange flavor from the orange marmalade works so wonderfully with the cranberries. And it doesn't need any added sugar. The sugar is right there already in the marmalade. So that's kind of a, a fun recipe to make. And then the one with the horseradish is, is just really different. And then I just just recently added one with uh, brown sugar and red wine and five spice powder. So we have all kinds of cranberry sauces for you. And we get a lot of questions about cranberries because on the Monash app, they do have uh, dried cranberries listed. And they, they tell you how much you can have, or rather how little you can have. Uh, and they tell you it's one tablespoon. Now I want you to pay attention to the fact that it's 15 grams because it's actually one Australian tablespoon, which is about one tablespoon and a teaspoon for us here in the US. So it's a little more than you might think. But what about fresh cranberries? So. Uh, I've spoken with the folks at Monash. We've had many conversations about cranberries, but you can also find the information on their blog. Um, and that's that fresh cranberries, they say are allowable in 130 gram portions. You can go to uh, FODMAP every day and we have a section called Explore an Ingredient. And we have a whole long thing about cranberries for you to read. So fresh cranberries or frozen cranberries um, are low FODMAP in small portions. In our recipes, we recommend to you that you stick with a two tablespoon serving size. So, you know, maybe not a ton, um, but enough right there on the side with your mashed potatoes and gravy. Um, I think it's enough to make you happy. And the other thing to always remember is that we are providing recipes that are considered safe for the elimination phase. But as always, these are guides. When you go through your structured elimination phase and when you go through your challenge phase, you will learn what your individual tolerances are. I can eat I can eat much more cranberry sauce than two tablespoons. So, but I learned, I learned from uh, doing this, uh, my challenges carefully and systematically. And that's why we always recommend that you work with a registered dietitian trained in FODMAPs, do the same thing uh, because ultimately, isn't that what you want to know? You want to be able to eat as broadly as possible, and maybe as much as possible, at least one day a year. Um, so we also have our registered dietitians, our international directory list. Um, you'll be able to find uh, someone to work with you. And even if they're not in your backyard, uh, many of the dietitians, also several of the dietitians that are admins on the Facebook groups, do phone consults, they do Skype consults, and it's really, really the way to go. So let's just touch briefly on appetizers and desserts. We are going to do a whole baking Facebook Live about a month from now, but um, we'll, we'll answer a few questions. So appetizers, you know, appetizers are one of those things. Oh, hold on a second. I, you know, I should probably check here. 
Uh, are there any, Robin, can you help me find any comments I'm missing? I'm not seeing things. I want to answer direct questions if people have them. So maybe if she can help me find that. In the meantime, um, so appetizers, you know, oh, here, Gerilyn, I know I'm going to eat foods that aren't FODMAP friendly and fat What's the best way to deal with a bloating gas? Okay. Well, Gerilyn, first I have to ask you, um, you know you're going to eat foods that aren't FODMAP friendly. I want to ask you why. Why? I mean, really, that's the first thing. You you know that the next day you're probably going to be telling yourself it isn't worth it. So I would first say try to think about all the things you can eat. Look at all the things we talked about, and then you won't be in this um, position. But what is the best way to do with bloating and gas? Now, this is not really a food question. This is a little more of a medical question. We don't uh, give medical advice. I will tell you that it's different for everybody. I'll tell you that for me personally, what I the, I had to lie down. For me, bloating and gas was a very, um, you know, the physics of standing upright and having the gas pressing up on my diaphragm was so painful that I had to lay down and getting into a hot tub was one of my personal big, um, you know, gas and bloat relievers. Uh, but this is something you should talk to. You know, you got a couple of weeks, talk to your registered dietitian, talk to your doctor. Maybe there are some over-the-counter medicines that they would recommend that you try, uh, but really, uh, why don't we try to keep you bloat and gas free and, you know, check out recipes that are going to keep you happy uh, without bloating you. The other thing that used to help me was walking, you know, after after a meal, move, move it around, try and get the gas out any way I could instead of uh, caught inside. Um, so appetizers, I mean, this this tags on to, to, to your um, question, Gerilyn, because um, so let's say you go to a party and there are going to be high FODMAP foods at this party. What we're trying to do is help you understand how to strategize uh, a way so that there's enough low FODMAP food that you aren't tempted by the high FODMAP food. And especially with things like appetizers and nibbles, we all know how easy it is to look at that plate of hummus and say to yourself, well, I know that hummus is safe in small amounts, and so I'm just going to take one carrot stick and take a little bit. And then the next thing we know, after a course of an hour, uh, we've done that four times or five times or six times, and we haven't even gotten to the main meal yet. So, you know, I think that it's a day for strategy, for really thinking ahead of time about what you are going to eat, what you are not going to eat what you're going to eat to satisfy you so you aren't tempted by the things that you shouldn't eat. And so when those nibbles and appetizers are spread out, um, that in particular, uh, be mindful. Because when we sit down at the actual meal and we take a portion of turkey and we take a portion of mashed potatoes and we take a portion of cranberry sauce, it's all on our plate. We can see it. Um, it, it makes more sense to us uh, from a portion perspective, but when appetizers and nibbles are just out on the coffee table or the buffet table and you're walking by and you're grabbing something every time you walk by for a couple of hours before the meal, I think that that can derail a lot of us. So what are some appetizers that you could bring? Um, Endive, which is you know a vegetable that maybe you don't think of a lot, but endive is a, a no FODMAP vegetable. And uh, Robin and I had done this beautiful cheese platter and charcuterie array where we took endive, and this is like an instant elegant appetizer, and just spread a little bit of goat cheese on the bottom of the spear. And then, you know, you could put a raspberry on it or a few pieces of pomegranate, or you would put, you know, a few crumbles of nuts and uh, or an olive, a slice of olive. And it makes this um, really delightful little finger food, which is very uh, low in FODMAPs. And that would be a very nice thing to nibble on. 
carrots, carrots, carrots. I say, you know, carrot sticks, they fill you up. You got to crunch them. They keep your mouth occupied for a while. And there are no FODMAPs. Um, I would definitely say do something with those. Radishes, radishes are no FODMAP. You could trim a few and have them on a crudite platter. So uh, appetizers, be mindful. If there's a platter of nuts, know your limits. 10 pecans or 10 walnut halves are a serving. Um, and that's actually a pretty big serving and you wanna be thinking about the stacking again. So, uh, but you know, a few would be fine. Now desserts, we are, uh, like I said, we're gonna be doing a whole low FODMAP baking uh, in a month, but let's just talk briefly about pies. You know, for so many Americans, the Thanksgiving table would not be complete without pies. And the two things that come to mind uh, for me, certainly, are the pie crust, which I'll address in a moment, and then pumpkin, pumpkin pie. We've got to talk about pumpkin pie. So, um, oh, Julia just said, uh, even though carrots are low FODMAP, aren't they high fiber? And they can be difficult to digest if eaten in large quantities. You know, Julia, thank you for pointing that out. As always, you know, your, as they say, your mileage may vary. Um, everybody has their own relationship to FODMAPs, just as everybody has their own relationship to um, high fat. Uh, in relation to their IBS, to fiber in relation to their IBS. If you know that the high fiber in carrots is something you want to steer clear of, certainly do. Um, we're just trying to give some tips that might help um, some people, but thank you for pointing that out. Um, now, crust, desserts. So we have a Pi 101 article, which is gonna help you learn how to not only make a low FODMAP gluten-free pie crust, but um, believe it or not, it is um, easier to work with than a uh, traditional pie crust. I promise you, it is actually one of the uh, low FODMAP recipes that I'm the most uh, proud of developing because it is so easy to work with and it is flaky and buttery and delicious. So check that out. Um, it works well for single crusted pies like pumpkin and it works great for double crusted pies. We're gonna be here uh, for about 10 more minutes. Uh, so if you have any questions, um, get them in and I'll try to address them. So let's talk about pumpkin for a moment. So now pumpkin, when we talk about um, pumpkin pie, we're talking about canned pumpkin. And most recipe developers use Libby's uh, canned pumpkin, and that is because it is very consist a very consistent product of high quality, and because it has a very dense, uh, dry texture that works wonderfully when making pies. And so Monash has told us that one third of a cup or 75 grams of canned pumpkin is low FODMAP. This means that you can have pumpkin pie. You can have a slice of pumpkin pie. Um, we have a couple of different pumpkin pie recipes on the site. Uh, one thing that we're very excited about is that Vanessa Cobarubia, who's one of our success team RDs, recently discovered a lactose-free evaporated milk um, made by Nestle. And I haven't been able to find it physically in any of my stores yet but you do have time to order it online if you want. And if you uh, like to make a classic pumpkin pie with evaporated milk, now you can do it with a lactose-free milk. Um, you can also use a lactose-free half and half. And sugar, sugar is low FODMAP. We can use sugar, we can use brown sugar, we can use very small amounts of, uh, very small amounts of uh, honey or molasses, just a little bit uh, for flavor if you want. Uh, we also have a pumpkin pie that has maple syrup, uh, which is also low FODMAP. So we have several desserts. We have a cheesecake tart with pomegranate on top. It's a lovely tart. Um, citrus, as we talked about before, 
no detectable FODMAPs and many oranges, just a, a, a platter with beautifully sliced oranges with some pomegranate seeds strewn about would be absolutely lovely. Um, Helly, what would you like to know? She wrote the word pumpkin. I'm not sure what she wants. Um, while she's answering, I want to show you guys two more things before we go. So whenever I do a Facebook Live, I bring my portable garden, and you're probably going, what, what the heck is that? Well, these are my leek and scallion greens that I regrow. I keep, I keep this in my window at all times. So I have tons of leek greens and scallion greens for all my stuffing and all of that. Oh, Denise said um, she used the evaporated milk in a pumpkin pie and she couldn't tell the difference. So you're the first person that I've heard from that's used the product. Thank you so much for letting us know. That's excellent. And the other thing that I wanted to show you, even though I don't drink, ta-da! So, this is a glass of wine. This is 150 milliliters. This is considered low FODMAP. Same amount for white wine, same amount for sparkling wine. So if you do want to have a little bit of alcohol um, for your holiday, you can. We have an article um, on uh, drinking and FODMAPs, so check that out. Now, several people have said, um, you know, uh, well, Helly's pointing out that some countries don't have canned pumpkin, and people are saying they've never seen the Libby's brand. Now, if you're in the U.S., you definitely can find Libby's. If you're outside of the country and you can't find canned pumpkin, my suggestion is because the kabocha squash, the Jap pumpkin, has no detectable FODMAPs in uh, tested amounts, I would cook that down. And I would puree it and use that uh, for pumpkin pie filling. Now, here's what you're looking for. And our explorant ingredient on pumpkin, we have an article, is going to explain all of this textural stuff to you. If you're cooking down your own Jap pumpkin, our canned pumpkin product is literally so dry and so thick that a spoon can stand up in it. That's what you need. You need to cook that pumpkin to a degree where the uh, water has evaporated and it's very thick and then you have to puree it in a food press processor with a metal blade um, until it's smooth, smooth, smooth. And that's what I recommend. Um, the recipe will not be the same. Um, because most likely it will not be the exact same texture as our canned pumpkin, but it's the place to start. So that is it for today. Any last minute questions, I'd be happy to field. If you, uh, if you miss this, if you end up watching this after the fact and you have questions, you can always contact us directly through the site. Uh, or through our Facebook page, or if you're on FODMAP every day and um, you're on a particular recipe, you can ask comments there. And Helly's asking about the importance of weighing food. All right, let's touch on that briefly. So in the US, we measure by volume mostly. Um, it's very typical for someone to say a cup of this or a half a cup of that. Um, from the beginning, uh, when we launched FODMAP every day, Robin and I knew that we wanted to uh, appeal to a global audience. We know people are suffering with IBS all over the world. All of our recipes are represented in metric as well. And even if you're in the US and you're used to using uh, volume measurements, we highly recommend that you get a scale and a digital scale is the best kind uh, because weighing food when you're working with a low FODMAP diet, when you're learning about the FODMAP diet, when you're working with your app and you see something says something's allowable at 150 grams or 20 grams, you're going to you're not going to know what that is uh without the scale that said um definitely check out the site for some of the photos we have pictures showing you what 30 grams of avocado looks like what 20 grams of apples looks like uh i've been taking pictures and cataloging them over the last several months uh of some foods that people really want to know well how much is that uh we have those photos 
Thank you, everyone. Everybody's saying thank you. Thank you for coming. And um, oh, a safe portion of stuffing. Denise, last question. Well, I can't tell you what a safe portion of stuffing is because stuffing could be so many different things, right? It could be cornbread, it could be bread, it could be a rice stuffing, it might have apples in there, it might not have apples in there. So if you wanna send me a recipe, for instance, if you're thinking about you know, a, a classic family recipe that you have that you'd like me to take a look at, uh, send it to me and uh, we will put posting dates uh, for our baking Facebook Live, which will happen uh, I think the second week of December, somewhere around there. And uh, you know that you can always find us at FODMAP every day. Thank you. Good night, everybody, or good day.